Then it got worse. It's not just that you don't need to understand and that you don't need to ask questions. You're not allowed to. If you're asking questions, that's rebellious. You're not being obedient. And so the first stage was religion demanded obedience. The second stage is it, it demanded ignorance, demanded ignorance. People who had previously been brilliant, intelligent, uh, wild, widely knowledgeable, suddenly became dumb. Religion dumbed down the population. What is this thing called religion? What do we make of it? What do we do with it? And what is it doing to us? So let's examine this a little bit. What exactly is religion? Now, I don't know what the dictionary says, but religion is a familiar and, and present way of life. So we know what it is in reality, on the ground. Of course, it all sounds great, you know, like the Russian constitution. <laughs> sounds very, the, the communist constitution. Sounds really good on paper. But what is it really? So at the beginning, and, and it's reasonable that things would start this way, religion simply was obedience to a divine code. Now that's God gave us a bunch of instructions, obedience to those instructions, that's religion. What is the purpose of the whole thing? Well, you know you're mortal. What's going to happen after? Aren't you worried? Well, we weren't worried, but they, they got us worried. And then we suddenly were concerned what's going to be after life. And so religion came along and said, we can guarantee you a good seat in heaven. But it didn't take very long, and we suddenly had many religions, each one claiming that they have the tickets. And that if you want to get to heaven, you've got to follow their rules. My, my point is, it was obedience. Obedience. You have to obey. Obedience will get you to heaven. Obedience uh, in a very realistic way makes understanding unnecessary. You don't need to know, you don't need to understand, just do what you're told and you'll be fine. Not surprisingly, there were many people who uh, were not inspired by that. Then it got worse. It's not just that you don't need to understand and that you don't need to ask questions. You're not allowed to. If you're asking questions, that's rebellious. You're not being obedient. And so the first stage was religion demanded obedience. The second stage is it, it demanded ignorance, demanded ignorance. People who had previously been brilliant, intelligent, uh, wild, widely knowledgeable, suddenly became dumb. Religion dumbed down the population. So it wasn't that you don't need questions, it was all of a sudden, a question is evil. So much has been written and so much has been said about the reaction to that kind of, of um, dehumanizing of the human being. And there was the backlash against religion, anti-religious, and so on. 
And the argument was, you can't just tell me what to do and turn my brain off. So we're not going to go I'm not going to go there tonight because that's, that's well established. There's another thing that religion did, which today is becoming very burdensome and unhealthy. And that is religion made us dependent. The first thing you're taught in a religious education is that you are dependent. The re religion, all religions, eventually became the message of dependence. You are helpless. You cannot handle life by yourself. You must depend on God. Only he can help you and so on and so forth. Aside from being born in sin, which is a theological concept, but just the fact that your business will not succeed. Your health will not stay. You, you cannot even survive uh, the traffic <laughs> without help from heaven. So you're totally dependent. That means that we are needy. And if you want to get your needs met, you have to pray a lot. You have to obey God. Stop asking questions and, you know, the whole thing. So now we have three problems. First of all, we have to be obedient. Secondly, we have to dumb down. And thirdly, we have to recognize and feel how dependent we are and how helpless we are without God. All three concepts are true. We are dependent on God. And yes, you have to obey him. And when it comes to God, we're all dumb. It's all true. So what are we doing to fix it? It seems like religion keeps telling us of our problems, but doesn't get to a solution. As we get closer to Mashiach, the world becomes more godly, despite what you read in the, in the headlines. The world is becoming more godly. But that's not reported. It doesn't make headlines. One of the ways in which the world is becoming more godly, we are coming to the realization that it's not true that I have to obey God. It's not true that I must sacrifice my well-being, my desires, my appetite to his will. It's not true that I have to stop thinking and dumb down. And it's not even true that I am needy. This is something really godly. And it's a really new development. And it's universal. The development is, <clears throat> I did not ask to be born. The reason I didn't ask to be born is because I don't need to. If I needed to, I would ask. I'm not bashful. We don't ask to be born because we don't need to. Is that true? Why do we need to be born? Why do you need to be born? What were you missing before you were born? If I don't need to be born and I didn't ask to be born, how can I be needy? I came into this world not needing anything, including life. I don't need it. But somehow, as soon as I get here, I'm burdened with all sorts of needs. So what happens? You, you, you grow up. You are raised with the message, you must, you have to. I think the first message, you have to catch the school bus. <laughs> you have to get to the bus on time, hurry up. 
Why do I have to catch the bus? Because you have to go to school. Why do I have to go to school? Aside from the fact, I'm six years old, what do you mean I have to? I am totally unreliable. <laughs> How can I have obligations and responsibilities? Who would trust me? I have to get to the bus. So if a child six years old is a little brighter than the average kid and he said, I have to get to the bus? No, you got to get me to the bus. So don't, don't rush me. <laughs> it's your burden, not mine. I'm six. But the message doesn't stop. You have to. You have to get good grades. You have to pass all the tests. You have to do your homework. You have to graduate. You have to make it into the best college and then you have to get a job. And by this time, or at this point, we're ready to quit. Don't want a job. <laughs> don't need a job. Whoa, 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 if you don't have a job, how are you going to pay your bills? I don't want to pay bills. <laughs> I didn't ask to be born and I have to pay the bill? <laughs> you invite me to lunch and then you give me the bill? Something doesn't add up here. So now you have to pay taxes. <laughs> and the mortgage. And your kids' tuition. So this is becoming really burdensome. And for some reason, it used to work. It used to work. You told the kid you've got to make it in time for school. They, they got up in the middle of the night. Like back on the farm, you got to milk the cow. Well, if I got to, then I get up and I do it. Today, you tell a kid you got to milk a cow, and it's like, I have to milk a cow? What, did I create cows? I didn't even ask to be born. How could it be my job to milk cows? So it gets a little heavy and depressing. So we figure, okay, let's go for therapy. Because, you know, this is getting to be a little depressing and heavy. You go for therapy and guess what you find out? You have needs you never even thought of. Forget the taxes. What are you going to do about the fact that your mother hates you? <laughs> you got to fix that. What about the fact that you were uh, neglected when you were a baby? You got to go back and be rebirthed. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't ask to be born the first time. I have to do it again. <laughs> now you know you have problems you never even thought of. So you figure, okay, this is not working. Let me go to religion. Maybe God will comfort me. <laughs> so you go to religion. You know what you find out? You think your needs are going to end when you die? No. You're going to need and need there too. So what are you going to do about that? At this point, people just quit. There's no hope. I don't know. I can't imagine it worked for thousands of years. The message that you have to was compelling, convincing, and effective. You told somebody what they have to do, they did it. Today's kids don't understand. Why? Why would you do it? And it could be that politics plays a big role. You know, when you live under a czar, you get very used to the fact that you do what you're told. So if the czar says, mm, you obey. So if your teacher says, you obey him too. If your parents say, you obey, you're into obedience, because so are your parents. Everybody obeys. Today, very different picture. If the president says, everybody runs to obey, That's today's biggest joke. So who do you obey? 
there is no obeying anymore in, in daily life. So when religion comes along and says you must obey, it's like a foreign language. I don't even know what the word means. How do you do that? When the czar was in charge, when the emperor told you what to do, when the king ruled, you had to dumb down. What good will your knowledge do? You're stuck. Jewish life, you live in a ghetto, you live in a shtetl, where are you going to go? Your father was a butcher, you're going to be a butcher. Your father was a cobbler, you're going to be a cobbler. What, what do you need to know? Your life is narrow, it's predictable. What do you need to read books for? Become a, an apprentice and learn how to cook or how to bake or how to sew. Because that's what you're going to be doing. Where do you think you're going? So when religion dumbed you down, uh, yeah, it made sense. Everybody's dumbing me down, might as well. But the worst thing was the burden. The burden. You must. The result of this obedience, dumbing down, and neediness, the result was God got lost in the shuffle. We were obeying God, but it really didn't matter. We were obeying obedience. It didn't matter who told me to do it. You could even get confused. Uh, this commandment, is that from God or from the Tsar? And it didn't make any difference because you had to do it anyway. So who are you obeying? We pretty much forgot. We were also dumbed down, so you didn't ask too many questions. Who are we obeying? And the neediness? Nobody questioned it. Because the bottom line was, get to the bus, get to the school, get your report card, get your graduation, get into a good college, get a good job, make a lot of money so that you can pay the bills. And if not, you're going to die. Well, nobody wants to die. That was the motivation. Today, people are saying, don't, don't threaten me. I'm going to do all of that just to not die? That's ridiculous. I didn't ask to be born. Death is no longer a threat. And this is pretty shocking. And that's why when I was a Mrs. Reagan, who said to the, to the teenagers of America, just say no to drugs. And the teenagers were like, huh? Why? Well, it, 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 could, it could kill you. Yeah, so. And the older generation didn't believe them. But they meant it. So what? Don't threaten me with death. It doesn't work anymore. That is a godly development, believe it or not. Because if we get to the truth, if we understand what God is all about and what the Torah is all about, it is not a religion. It is not obedience. It is not dumbing down. And you don't need it. You don't need it. This message that you are needy is unhealthy, it's nasty, it's cruel, and it's not true. And because it's not true, we find it so burdensome. Don't tell me what to do. Why are we so allergic all of a sudden? Why are we so allergic to rules and demands and expectations? and responsibilities. It's because some sense in us recognizes that it is not true. It can't be. It can't be that I need anything. If I didn't ask to be born, what could I possibly need? So here's where psychology needs to upgrade its thinking. 
if you look into the soul of, of a human being, you will find deep, repressed, unrequited love, needs, drives, no. If you look into the soul of a human being, you will find that the, the person needs nothing. The real essence of you does not need anything. All needs are external, they're, they're imposed, they're not yours, you don't need them. You're burdened with it, but it doesn't belong to you. Like for example, I need to eat, don't I? I mean, you gotta eat. Yes, you gotta eat, but don't call it my need. I need to stop eating. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> I don't need to eat. I need to stop eating. Why can't I? Why can't I? Well, to live and to be healthy, you must eat. Whose weird idea was that? If you designed yourself, would you design yourself this way? Every three hours, drop what you're doing, time to eat. It's a ridiculous plan. Half your life, you have to sleep. Who designed us this way? It wasn't Tesla. So don't say, I need to eat. I don't need this. It's not a need, it's a handicap. And I need that like a hole in the head. So to say human beings need to eat? No, human beings need to be human, not half animal. So I was talking to this young woman who, who was suffering from anorexia. And she had had uh, a lot of therapy and, and it was under control. It was, she was not in danger anymore, but she says, I still find eating distasteful. I said, so do I. It's disgusting. And it's a handicap. And it's humiliating. The greatest brain surgeon in the world in the middle of a great operation has got to stop and eat some grass, a carrot, <laughs> lettuce, like a rabbit. Here's the brain surgeon of the century, and he has to eat the same things the rabbit's going to eat. In fact, the rabbit will eat it first if he doesn't grab it. <laughs> so now you're in competition with a rabbit. So it's so humiliating. Anyway, I went on and on about what, what the Mishnah says about eating, eating too much, etc. She says, you're worse than me. <laughs> and it cured her. <laughs> To find somebody worse than you, that's a good cure. I said, look, I don't know why God did this to us. It's so humiliating. But what are you going to do? You have no choice. You swallow your pride and you eat something. She was okay with that. Yes, you have to swallow your pride. So to say this is a definition of a human being, a human being needs to eat. This is not a definition of me. I don't need to eat. But I was designed with a dependence on food. I was designed with a dependence on sleep. I even have to breathe. In LA. <laughs> That's not a good plan. <laughs> It is so obvious, and yet it took us 5,000 years to come to this realization. I need, I don't even need to be born. The real essence of me needs nothing. In a sense, 
being born means you're not free to be you. Because you would not eat and you would not sleep and you would not breathe that stuff. <laughs> but you have no choice. So let's take a look at what the Torah actually says. And once you see it, it is so obvious. It is so simple, so real. What are the first words of the Torah? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. You can close the book. That's enough knowledge. You know everything you need to know. Because what does that tell you? In the beginning, which means before there was you, God created the world. So now you need to pay the mortgage. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> No, I don't. If in the beginning God created heaven and earth, he has a need. Because he created the world with a purpose. So who's needy? The creation or the creator? Who is needy, the painter or the painting? How did the painting become responsible for hanging itself? <laughs> well, now you got to hang somewhere. <laughs> you hang me. You're the creator. Doesn't that make a lot more sense? Is that not the truth? You remember begging to be born? Please, please, I want to pay mortgages. <laughs> I want to breathe. No, we don't. At best, we would go for the nine months of pregnancy. That's a great time. No mortgages. <laughs> no school buses. It's a wonderful time. And then the trauma of birth erases the memory of the good times. So here's the story. Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of creation. Whose anniversary is it? Well, that's the day Adam and Eve was created and were created, and it's uh, the the anniversary of humankind. Thank you very much, but we didn't ask to be born, so I'm not celebrating that anniversary. Like this guy who's suing his parents for giving birth to him without his consent. <laughs> True story. They threw it out of court. Because the parents argued that they tried to ask him for his consent, but they couldn't find him. <laughs> it's the anniversary of creation for the Creator. Doesn't that make more sense? God says, I created the world in six days and I rested on the seventh. And that's why the seventh is special. But that's also why the day of creation is special. For Him. He's the Creator. He is the King of the world. He is the one with the need. And what does he need? Well, what could God need? He's eternal. He's infinite. He's perfect. He's all powerful. What could he need? God hints at what he needs when he says, in the middle of creation, it is not good for man to be alone. Guess who he was talking about? Himself. By saying it is not good to be alone, he created that need in his creations. 
That's what we mean, that we are created in his image. He does not want to be alone, and he created us with this distaste or this um, non-contentment with aloneness. Um, you remember the song Piano Man? Yeah. You do? Yeah. You're old. <laughs> Who sang the song? There's a line in that song that is really very useful. It's brilliant. They're sharing a drink they call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. Remember that line? They're sharing a drink called loneliness. If you're lonely, you go to a party. What do you do? You share your loneliness. You meet another person who's lonely, and you sit there and you're lonely together. <laughs> but then you go home. When you come home, you realize you're not just lonely. You're alone, and you can't share that. Not even at a party. Not even after a few drinks. You're alone. And for some reason, mysterious reason, we don't like it. Now this, this is a, a really deep mystery to think about. Is it not good to be alone? Or is it wonderful to be alone? We can't seem to make up our mind. <laughs> God says it is not good to be alone. And yet you hear people everywhere saying, leave me alone. <laughs> so you want to be alone or you don't want to be alone? Is it good to be alone or not good? If you were perfect, if you were completely independent, wouldn't it be perfect to be alone? If I can take care of myself, what are you interfering with my life? Leave me alone. It seems like the only reason we need help, we need companionship, we need friendship, we need marriage, is because you know, we're not all powerful. I don't know how to do laundry, so I have to get married. <laughs> And you don't know how to parallel park, so you... <laughs> that's why we get married. Do my laundry, I'll park the car. <laughs> but if I could parallel park and do laundry, why would I need you? <laughs> it would be very good. Complete, total independence. Macho man. God said, no, it's not going to be good. Why? For no reason. Alone is not godly. Even if you're perfect. So God says, I'm perfect, but I'm alone. I don't like it. Why? No, you don't get it. I don't like it. Why not? You didn't hear me. It I don't like. Not because it makes some other problem for me. It is what I don't like. I don't like being just me. Why? What's going to happen? Nothing is going to happen. I don't like being alone. Why? Can't you park a car? In other words, it's the thing itself that is objectionable, not its consequence, not something else. It is not acceptable. So God, who is absolutely perfect, but alone, the only being, says this is not good. Why does he say it? So that we feel it too. And that's why we get married. You want me to sum it up? 
the reason you get married is for nothing. <laughs> if you're getting married for something, don't do it. Pay someone <laughs> to park your car or do your laundry. It's cheaper. <laughs> don't get married for something. Get married for nothing because you're already perfect. What does this do for us? All of a sudden, we've got a new picture of everything. I need nothing. God, the creator, the perfect, infinite being, has a need. And if he has a need, it's pretty awesome. Because he doesn't know how to do things part way. Everything about him is infinite. If he has a need, it's infinite. It's eternal. It's him. And what is his need? To have us so that he is not alone. This explains why we have free choice. Why did he give us free choice? Knowing we're going to mess up. Knowing we're going to turn against him with our free choice. Because if we don't have free choice, he's still alone. If you marry your clone, you're still alone. In, in order to not be alone, he had to create someone other than himself. Free choice. With the, uh, with the idea that this other will join and we will become one. That's what we mean when we say God is one. Hashem Echad. We don't mean there's only one God. That's his problem. What he wants is to become one. United. Become one through inclusion, not exclusion. He doesn't want to be the only one. He wants to be one with us. <coughs> And because he created us in his image, we also don't want to be alone. We want to be joined, connected, merged with him so that we become one together, not by exclusion, <coughs> but by inclusion. Doesn't it now make sense that he gave us a Torah? If he's the one who's needy, if he created the world out of a divine need, isn't he going to tell us what he needs? He has to. How else are we going to join him and become one with him? So he has to tell us. So when my grandfather sits me down and says, 3,300 years ago, God came down at Mount Sinai and gave us a Torah. I said, oh, what took him so long? He waited 2,000 years to tell us what he needs. But fine, now we know. So what is the Torah? God's needs. God reveals himself. That's why it's called revelation at Mount Sinai. God says, this is what I need. This is how we become one. I keep Shabbos. Keep it with me. Because if I'm sitting by my Shabbos table and you don't show up, it's not working. So do I need to keep Shabbos? We actually had a student at Beis Chana. When she left, she decided she was going to observe Shabbos. A couple of months later, she calls me with a problem. What is the problem? I'm keeping Shabbos, but I don't need this. I said, yeah, so what's the problem? She said, no, no, really, I don't need this. I said, I know you didn't create the world in the six days and rest on the seventh. Of course you don't need it. What made you think you needed it? And the same is true with every commandment. We don't need it. We don't need anything.
psychologically, this is so liberating. I am not needy. I don't have to obey. I don't have to dumb down. I don't have to anything. <laughs> I don't have to be born. Which leaves me free as a bird. Uh, more than a bird. A bird's got to get there early to catch the worm. I don't have to. <clears throat> It's very liberating. On the other hand, if I have no needs, what am I doing here? Very good question. If I don't need this, why do I have this? I didn't ask to be born, then why am I here? <laughs> so this guy says, well, my father, his fault. I'm born because he caused my birth. So let him pay my bills. But you know what the father says? Hey, wait, 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 wait. I didn't ask to be born either. So get it from my grand, <laughs> get it from my father. And his father says, hey, I, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> Where does the buck stop? With God. God decided that I have to be here. He needs me to be here. He needs me to eat. I don't know why. So what am I left with? For myself, I need nothing. I'm free as a bird. And on the other hand, I have the opportunity to serve the creator of the whole world. What a great deal. No pressure and the greatest opportunity. When it comes Rosh Hashanah this year, we have to celebrate it differently than ever before. This is God's day. And he says, coronate me. Ask me to be your king. I want to be your king. But if you don't want me, it's not going to work. So we come to the synagogue on, on, on Rosh Hashanah and we blow the shofar, not because we need, but because we hear his need. And you know, to do for others is so much more enjoyable than to do for myself. Every mother knows this. Once the kids leave the house, what are you cooking for? All of a sudden, cooking becomes such a burden. Cook for somebody else. That makes sense. For yourself, it's a burden. I'll go out and buy some ready-made. <laughs> but not for the kids. So to serve someone else is so much more enjoyable, so much more inspiring. And if it's God, it's so much more compelling. God is waiting for you. How long can you say no? So when it comes Yom Kippur, people say, you know, I've been saying no all year. I think I better show up. You can't ignore him completely. Can't ignore him completely. So when people say, oh, I don't need this. I don't need to be religious. Well, finally, you're catching on. You don't need to be religious. God created the world with a vast eternal plan. You want to help out or not? Not today? How about tomorrow? Sometime? That's why it's called serving Him. It's a literal expression. We serve Him. Because he's the needy one. We have no needs. So what are you going to do? Sit around doing nothing? So when we hear his needs, we're like relieved. Oh good, you need something because I don't know what I'm doing here. 
I got no needs. So when God calls Abraham, God calls Avraham, what does Avraham say? Hineni. <laughs> you know what Hineni means? I'm unemployed. <laughs> Give me a job. Tell me you need something because I don't know what I'm doing here. I didn't ask for this. So God says, yeah, I asked for you. Oh, okay. What do you need? What can I do for you? When you go to the Western Wall and you put a note into the wall, say to God, need me? I hope so. Because otherwise, I don't belong here. So who is the needy one? Where does need really exist? Now think of it this way. God gave us the Ten Commandments. And 40 days later, we made a golden calf. Why? Because we felt the need. Because Moses disappeared. He didn't come back. He was supposed to come back on the 40th day and, and the day passed and he wasn't back. And we needed something. So you know what the sin of the golden calf was? We decided that we needed God had just finished telling us what he needs, and we turned around and said, well, uh, we need. That's idolatry. It's not the golden calf that is the idol. You're the idol. Only God needs, because he is the only creator. Creations don't need. Don't play God. When you start feeling needy, you're becoming God. It's not nice. And you're, you're going to regret it because being God is so difficult. <laughs> it's a full-time job. You become needy, you become weak. You become exhausted. You be, you're drained. You're not cut out to be needy. So when you think you're needy, you're making yourself crazy. And that's why finally, as we get closer to Moshiach, we're catching on. I'm cracking up because I need what I don't need. That'll make anybody crazy. And that's why the healthiest thing we can do is to look around and see who needs me. Somebody's got to need me. Because I have nothing else to do here. That's what Hineni means. Hineni means, please, give me a job. I'm totally available. I've got nothing else on my agenda. I'm here for you. That's called serving God. Religion has become self-serving. What will it do for you? Will it get you to heaven? Will it get you to the top of heaven, to the heaven of heavens? Front seat, box, a box seat. Don't, don't do this to yourself. When God came down to Mount Sinai, he did not burden us. He unburdened himself. He said, this is what I need from you. This is why I created you. Be mine. Join me. Let's become one. And that's why the description of the perfect time when the world will reach its perfection. What is the description? On that day, God will be one. What is he today? Alone. One means joined, united with someone. When we serve God properly, on that day, God will be one, which is all he wants. He just doesn't want to be the only. He wants to be the one. And that's what our marriages should become. When you get married, you're basically saying, I have nothing else to do. Right? <laughs> you get married when you have nothing else to do. 
you meet somebody who also has nothing else to do. That's a match made in heaven. You're both perfect, and you just don't like being alone. So you get married, and you become one. That's it, people. That is the whole divine truth. So come. Come on, Rosh Hashanah. You don't need it? Perfect. That's why you should come. Because he needs you far more than you need him. And that's the truth. So it's not obedience that he wants. He wants oneness. It's not dumbing down that he wants. He wants to be known, understood, and cared for. So once he tells us what he needs, he's expecting us to be sympathetic, to be willing, to even be excited about joining him in his need. What could be greater? So imagine if tomorrow everybody in the world wakes up and says, what am I doing here? I don't need this. That would be so good. That would be the beginning of perfection. Not the end of history, the beginning of everything. Until now, we've just been practicing, warming up, trying to figure ourselves out. Not very useful. Now, we can become very useful because I don't need this. So if I can be useful to you, that is the biggest blessing for me. You're doing me a favor by needing me. We would rather be needed than needy. That's not dumb. That's sensible. It's much better to be needed than to be needy. So when we come into Rosh Hashanah this year, don't come with a bunch of needs. Don't come begging God. Come to God with joy and say, I, we finally grew up. We don't need anything. Can we do anything for you? Like somebody asked a rabbi, isn't there one thing that I can do for God that is really meaningful? And if he was a good rabbi, you know, like a Chabad rabbi, <laughs> he would say, why only one thing? It just happens to be, there are 613 things you can do for him that is really meaningful to him and really satisfies the desire which made him create the world. Big smorgasbord. 613. Take your pick. But just don't ignore him. He's the one who has the need. You are needed. It's a blessing. That is not religion. That's just cooperation. God went out of his way because of his need to have you join him. Well, one of these days, join him. What are you waiting for? You have something else to do? No. That's why serving God is a joy. Ivdu es Hashem b'simcha is not another demand. Oh, not only must you serve him, you must do it with a smile. <laughs> That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, if you're busy serving him, you have reason to smile. If you're busy taking care of your needs, you're justified in being depressed. So, make a choice. You want to serve him with a smile or take care of your needs on Zoloft? 
<laughs> Not much of a choice. Yes? What if I feel like I, I just can't follow the 613 commandments, or even maybe one? I can't either. <laughs> I've got a really bad memory, and 613 is just too much to remember. Never mind, do. Do the one that you can do. He will be so pleased, he will give you the strength to do another one. He knows who he's dealing with. <laughs> he knows we are not infinite. He knows we are not angels. All he wants is cooperation. So if you do one mitzvah, you're in. You're, you're among the good guys. If you can do two, you'll do two. The question is, what do we do with all the needs we've got? <laughs> the what? Needs. What needs? Health needs. Very up our children needs. <laughs> needs a better job. We need more money. We have needs. So the obvious question is, what do we do with that stuff? The first thing is, disown them before you get depressed. <laughs> there is a need for money. Don't make it personal. I don't need money. Uh... Somebody should pay the bill. <laughs> the bill needs to get paid, but it's not my need. That doesn't describe me. It doesn't make me who I am. And it is not the most important thing in life. So here's how it works. You know, we're always told to do everything for the sake of heaven. Yeah, l'shem shamayim. Eat l'shem shamayim. We always thought that that meant, first of all, that you can't just eat. Even eating is burden. You, well, you have to eat for a heavenly purpose, which meant you got to be thinking that I'm only eating in order to gain strength from the food so that I can later do a mitzvah. If you could convince yourself that that's why you're eating, you're pretty good. <laughs> but now with the new insight that we have, to eat for a heavenly purpose is simply a fact of life. Every time you eat, it's for a heavenly purpose. Because you didn't choose this. God needs you to eat. So when you eat, you're doing what he needs. Don't steal it from him and say, no, I need to eat. No, it's his. It's his. Render onto um, whatever. <laughs> uh, Friedman, I'm hello. I'm going to follow up on what Rabbi Leader asked you. Yes. His name's Ruben Haley. Wait, you need a loan? What? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, just add it to, I'll just add it to the current loan. Go ahead. So, Rabbi Leader asked, you know, we all have needs, Parnassa, uh, Parnassa uh, for the kids, etc. So, how does one deal with, you know, for example, at work, I have a, I have a, I have a to-do list of approximately a few hundred things. So each day I get it done about maybe one or two. And during that time, I have assigned to me maybe about 10. So the list, keep, the list keeps growing and growing. So the same thing applies with, with, uh, with, with, regarding, the, with regarding the kids, with regarding the tuition and the mortgage and the this and that. I'm you know, the, the breadwinner, so I take money a lot. So the question is, how can you, how can you truly um, rise above all of that when, you, and when, and when you get when you accomplish one thing and get across one obstacle, Mazel tov, you have now five that are that are now waiting, and now you have to deal with that. Enough already. That's I don't, what I don't, I don't need this. That's what I was saying. It's depressing. Yeah, it is. You can't get out from under. Yeah. So what are we? Big, I'm a strong guy. I'm not that strong. So, what, what is the traditional religious answer? Trust God. Trust God, He'll provide. Good, have him write a check. <laughs> you know, they joke about the, the truck and the helicopter and the boat. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. He writes checks all the time. 
just not to you. He <laughs> <laughs> actually no other author. He, he writes me good sized checks, except they're unfortunately he writes me a big check this big, but I need a check this big. What is the what is the the rationale? What is, what is the sense of trust him he'll provide? That I give up control. Mm. That's the old way of thinking. Not that old, but that's the way I think. I know. That's what that's what's getting passed down. The rationale is he created you, he needs you. Of course he'll provide. Why would he mess up his own plan? That's the, the justification for trusting him. It's like this woman said, I don't think I'll ever have a baby, I've tried. And the rabbi said to her, no, you have to trust God. She says, based on what? He said, based on the fact that he wants you to have a child more than you want. So you don't have to convince him, you don't have to beg him, he wants more than you want. It, change, it changes the entire, um, what is it, the, the, the pressure. Where is the pressure, on me or on him? So you are perfectly justified to say to God, you want me to serve you, you know, make it possible. Don't reward me, just make it possible. Give me the means to serve you. But when you turn around and say, no, no, I need. Now you're at odds. Your need, his need. Yeah, because I want a vacation. <laughs> so does he. But he can't. There was a boy who went to yeshiva in France back in the 60s. And the yeshiva in France was like on the old style, your um, European style. Anyway, he came to the yeshiva. On the first day, he walked into the dean's office and he said, I have to call my mother. And the dean, who was the rabbi, the Rosh Yeshiva, he said to him, what do you mean I what do you mean, have to? I have to call my mother. He said, what do you mean, I? What do you mean, have to? And it changed this kid's life. I have to call my mother. Really? You have to? What should he have said? It's just so, it's just so simple. And truth must be simple. You need to call your mother. You're the one who needs. Compared to your mother's need, not nice. I need compared to his need. He needs to feed me. Doesn't he? And that's why the Gemara says, Man de Yohav Chaya, Yohav Mezena. If he gave you life, of course he's going to give you what to eat. Why would he give you a life and then not let you live? That would sabotage his plan, not your need. So if you're working with him, it's a little easier to bear. If you don't think I need money right now and I can still serve you well, Let's try it. <laughs> You're going to regret it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you mentioned Zoloft, you triggered a, a thought. <laughs> you don't even have to take it, you just have to mention it. <laughs> is, is depression in your... In your Let's take a survey. Is depression real? Or is it a failure to just get it right? I mean, I didn't think everything you said, at least the part I remember to look for, and um, realize that perhaps when people feel depressed, that they're just getting it all wrong, they're getting things backwards, 
and then their or the priorities, or whatever you want to call it, not particularly as well, but that's your, that's your job. But is, <laughs> is it a real entity, given that so much of this is just how you see things and how you don't personalize everything, but rather look for some other purpose? Does it apply to this, or is that truly an entity unto itself which requires more attention? There, there is an illness called depression whether it's hormonal or genetic or what, whatever the cause, that is an illness called depression. But then there's depression that is simply um, an existential problem. The existence and the maintenance that goes into maintaining our existence can be depressing. The most depressing thing is pointlessness. So what? So what? That drives us crazy. And it's not an illness. That's the mind trying to work its way through life in an intelligent fashion. And when things don't make sense, it's depressing. And um, in that sense, Torah is a cure for our existential problem. And that's why we're always asking, why are we here? It's a very good question. It's a necessary question. Because we're human beings, not animals. We need to understand the world in which we, in which we exist. And when we realize that all we're doing is eating so that we can eat again tomorrow, this is depressing. We need a purpose and a meaning. Without that, it's depressing. It's not an illness. It's a sign of humanity. Trees don't get depressed. They don't need a purpose. They're fine. Human beings need to understand where we fit in. And if we don't understand, we, we are... You can use the word depressed or disheartened, perplexed, frustrated by the lack of answer. That's a different kind of depression. It's not an illness. You don't go to a doctor. You go to the Torah and find out why you're here. That's why very often a person who is depressed is advised to go take care of someone who needs more than you need, mm -hmm. and that's a cure. Mm -hmm. You come out of your um, directionless, pointless, purposeless existence. Suddenly you have a purpose. But if we all knew how God needs us, there would never be a problem. Because there's never a moment when he doesn't need something from you that you can do. Like we were saying, you, not 613 at one time, just something. How does one reconcile all this that you've said with the basic Jewish tenet and Hasidic tenet that God is perfect and doesn't need you? God is perfect and therefore doesn't need anything. That's actually a toxic thought. It's that toxic, means... But it's still stated wait, wait. black and white. But that means that if I'm perfect, then I don't need you. Does that make me a better person? No. It's, it really is a bad, a bad message. God is perfect. He doesn't need you. Well, then if I'm perfect, I won't need you either. And I want to be perfect. <laughs> so until I get perfect, in the meantime, I don't need you. I'm practicing being perfect. <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing. When we say God needs nothing, we mean that he cannot gain any quality or any property that he doesn't already have. 
If you serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, he will not get older. He will not get bigger. He will not get stronger. He will not get smarter. That means he's perfect. On top of being perfect, he is also humble. And just being himself, perfect me, is not enough. So he's perfect because he needs nothing, but he's also lovable because he needs someone. And that, I think, is the best argument. If he is perfect and needs nothing, how do you demand that I love him? Doesn't make any sense. He's not lovable. First of all, he's unknowable, right? Nobody knows God. Nobody can understand him. And he doesn't need you. But you should love him with all your heart. Something's not adding up here. And this is part of why the Alter Rebbe wrote the Tanya. The Alter Rebbe's birthday is coming up on the 18th of the month, the same day as the Baal Shem Tov was born. What did the Alter Rebbe say? Jews love God instinctively, naturally. So how come they don't? <laughs> the Torah says you do, but look around. The answer is, well, the God you think about, the God you believe in, is not lovable. <laughs> You're right, but you got the wrong picture. True God is perfect and needs nothing. But needing nothing is not the same as needing no one. And the same is true with marriage. You don't need anything from your wife. And your wife doesn't need anything from you, which is good because she's not getting anything. <laughs> <laughs> It works out perfect. <laughs> My husband is good for nothing. <laughs> That's why you married him. <laughs> if he was good for something, you would hire him. <laughs> you get married because you need nothing, but you need someone. Isn't that beautiful? God needs you to be, to be with him, to be his. Now, does that need make him imperfect? Think about this. He needs you, and you're not available to him. I hate to walk out. Yes? He needs you, but you're not available. What is he missing? If needing you makes him imperfect, he needs you, he doesn't have you. What is he missing? He's not missing anything. You're missing. He misses you, not something. And that's why even if you sin, he still needs you. doesn't like you. <laughs> But he needs you. In fact, if you're not there, he needs you a little more. So it is not an imperfection to need someone. It's a greatness. To need something, that's an imperfection. And that's why he needs us unconditionally. It's not for something, just for us. It's also true that God is not knowable. How can a human being know God? Not possible. Until God gives us the Torah and makes himself known. In other words, by nature, the finite being cannot know an infinite being. Unless... The infinite being makes himself known. And certainly he can do that. So we do not know God means 
Well, without the Torah. It's true. Same with the need. God needs nothing except what he chooses to need out of humility, not out of imperfection. So both things are true. He does need nothing. But needing someone is very different than needing something. And everyone knows this in their marriage. You need me for what? <laughs> That's an insult. So if your wife ever asks, what do you need me for? Don't answer. <laughs> don't, don't be suicidal. No matter what you say, it's wrong. <laughs> the best thing you can say is, I don't know. I just can't be without you. That's true. I'm getting nothing from you. <laughs> but I can't be without you. That's a marriage. Not a partnership, not a roommate. That's a marriage. It's not what I'm getting from you. It's you. I like to use this example. Your, your wife is out of town. You miss her. What do you miss about her? <laughs> I miss her. She's not home. I miss her. But then as soon as she walks in the door, <laughs> it becomes about something. Oh, good, you're back. <laughs> Why can't we miss each other when we're present? Just each other. Not something from each other, about each other. That's what marriage is. Two people merging to where I don't know who I am without you. What do I need from you? Exactly what I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I think it's a mistake to think that to assume that being perfect and needing something is mutually exclusive. It's not mutually exclusive. If by <coughs> definition, God is perfect, and having a need, regardless of whether you call it an it or a person or whatever, the fact that if he's perfect, which we assume, that is what we assume by definition, then the fact that he has the need is part of the definition of perfection. Therefore, we are not perfect because if you say we don't have needs, therefore we are not perfect because to be perfect, you have to have a need because God's perfect by definition, he has a need. So it's a matter of, of, of redefining conceptually what perfection means. And it's very easy to do that by assuming God's perfect. You've got a need, that's part of being perfect. It, it's, it shouldn't be taken that it's mutually exclusive that being perfect and having a need are separate. They obviously go together because God's perfect. So you don't even have to separate me, someone, and something. You could say it doesn't matter. Someone, something, it's, it doesn't matter. It's part of the definition of perfection since God has a need that is perfect. And you yourself said we don't have a need, therefore we're not perfect. So that solves it right there. And for me, not having a need is perfect. <laughs> There's another way of saying it, right? God is perfect. Does that mean he has no purpose? He has no intention? He has no creativity? It's like perfection is a dead end. If you got to talk to God, right? What would you say to him? Knowing that he's perfect. What would you say? What's new? <laughs> Nothing. So what's happening? Nothing. <laughs> How are you aging? <laughs> it's a dead end. So everybody agrees God created the world with a purpose. But he needs nothing. What? He created the world for a purpose he doesn't need? Doesn't sound good. In fact, this kid said, a kid, 11, 12 years old, he said, God doesn't need, God wants. Not bad, huh? I said, God wants something he doesn't need? And the kid said, oh, right, can't be. That's immature. 
<laughs> to want what you don't need, then you're a baby. So if he wants, he needs. And if he needs, he really needs. Not like us. Our needs change every day. And they only last for 80, 90 years. When he needs, like, like you're saying, he needs like everything else about him. His knowledge is perfect, his strength is perfect, his needs are perfect. Not handicaps like our needs. But the convincing argument is, how do we make fun of idols in the Torah? How do we make fun of idols? They have eyes that don't see, they have ears that don't hear, they have a mouth that doesn't speak. Are we saying the same thing about God? He doesn't see, he doesn't care, he doesn't hear. No, no. God is a living God. Melech Chai. Living means responsive, concerned, reaction. If we love him, it matters. If we hate him, it hurts. He's real. Yes, true. We are partners in creation because he really needs us, otherwise we're not partners. And we can really do something, otherwise we're not partners. So it's a huge compliment to us. It makes God real, relevant, lovable, knowable. It undoes all the damage that religion brings. So, let's walk away feeling, I need nothing because I'm so insignificant, but God who is infinite needs insignificant people. And that is a double blessing. It takes the burden off me and makes me really significant to him. That's what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. When the headlines say he's here, then he'll be here. <laughs> when the headlines say we're headed for war, uh, <laughs> a good sweet year, everybody. Amen. Only good news. Partner with Rabbi Friedman. Visit it's good to know.org forward slash support. Thank you.